This video is brought to you by VinFast. With soaring energy prices and ever-increasing summer temperatures, homeowners face a very serious dilemma to be cool or not to be cool. And more comfortable, not to mention safer home temperatures worth the extra cost in energy bills. Well, what if the answer was actually right below your feet? I'm talking about geothermal heat pumps, and I think they're about to become the next big thing in residential heating and cooling. Here's why. If you follow our channel, you know how much I love how insanely efficient heat pumps are. So imagine my excitement when I found out the geothermal or ground source heat pumps can actually take those levels even higher. Ironically, by taking the technology lower. Like all heat pumps, geothermal models have three main components. The heat pump, the liquid exchange medium, and a distribution system. The main difference then is that geothermal ductwork runs in loops between four and 10 feet underground, where the temperatures are almost always between 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. To understand why this is, let's break this down by summer and winter. In the summer, the sun is warming the surface of the soil all day. From here, the soil is radiating and conducting heat downward. To better understand this, let's first look at a wall in your home. If your walls were made out of pure metal like aluminum, we can understand how much heat is transferred via conduction by comparing the temperature on the sunny side versus the inside. For an aluminum wall, which conducts heat really well, the temperature difference would be pretty small. This is why you don't build homes out of aluminum. If instead we use a typical wood wall with insulation, the temperature profile would look like this, meaning much less heat is transferred. Going back to our ground, which isn't really good at transferring heat, you'll see that even if the surface is really hot, dig down about 10 feet and the temperature doesn't change much at all. Now in the winter, the cold air cools the surface of the ground, especially once the sun sets. But again, a few feet underground and the impact is very minimal. The important thing here to know is that pretty much everywhere in the world, there's almost always a heat differential between the air and the ground. Heat pumps work based on thermodynamic principles. That's the heat always moves from high temperatures to lower temperatures. Geothermal heat pumps come in a few varieties. The two biggest categories are open loop systems, which do not recirculate the water, but instead deposit it into a drain after use, or closed loop systems, which circulate a mixture of antifreeze and water. We're not going to dive into the different varieties here, but my friend Matt Farrell over on his channel Undecided has an awesome video you can check out here. Like other heat pump technology, geothermal heat pumps have incredibly high coefficients of performance. High efficiency gas furnaces have an efficiency around 97%, but standard furnaces hover around 80%. So for every 100 BTUs of energy that your furnace consumes, you're only actually getting between 80 and 97 BTUs of heat. BTU or British thermal units refer to the amount of energy it takes to increase the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Anyway, let's not get into a unit war here, but 80 to 97% efficient is pretty good, right? So what about electric heaters? Well, if you remember from our previous heat pump video, you'll remember that the efficiency of an electric heater is pretty much 100%, meaning that you consume one watt of power and you're gonna get one watt of heat. And that's great. But in 2020, according to the survey by the EIA, only about 37% of Americans are actually using electricity to heat their homes. And that's because natural gas in the US is very cheap. Now this is the opposite in most of the rest of the world, especially in Europe, where natural gas prices are so high that heat pump heating is much more common. A staggering 41% of Americans still use natural gas as their main source of heat, while another 8% rely on petroleum. So how can the heat pump do better? Unlike gas and electric heaters, heat pumps are measured in coefficient of performance, which means that an air source heat pump can reach COPs of between three, four, and five. That means for 100 BTUs of energy input, you can get 300, 400, or 500 BTUs of heat. And that's because you're not making heat, you're just moving it around. But one main advantage ground source heat pumps have over air source heat pumps is consistency. See, while air source heat pumps are generally the most efficient, their efficiency hinges on outside air temperature. They actually tend to work best when the outside air temperature is around 40 degrees or higher. When the temperature falls below the 40 degree mark, heat pumps start losing that efficiency, the coefficient of performance, and when the air gets really cold, below 25 or 30, they actually lose their spot as the most efficient heating option. This is where geothermal heat pumps really begin to shine. No matter how wildly the air temperatures might vary, underground temperatures 
are always going to be pretty consistent between 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Always. No matter how grueling the winter gets, the geothermal heat pump will almost always work at its maximum efficiency. And just how efficient is that? Depending on the system, geothermal heat pump COPs can range between 300 and 600, making them significantly more efficient than gas or electric, and at the worst, comparable to air source heat pumps. So when the temperatures outside are pretty moderate, air source and ground source are not too different. But if you have a scorching hot day and you're running your air conditioner, or a freezing cold day and you want to get heat, that's where geothermal heat pumps really shine. So why should these numbers matter to you? Well, a higher efficiency system means more money in your pocket. But before we talk about exactly why, let me tell you about our sponsor this week, VinFast. VinFast is a new EV startup, which is a part of a bigger company called the Vin Group from Vietnam. This is part of the amazing part about electric vehicles. When you ditch the ICE engine, you use all that IP, suddenly a whole slew of new companies can start making EVs. For example, this, the VF9, or this, the VF8. And in a couple of years, they'll even have an even smaller version called the VF7. So the reason why this car has me excited is because I've been looking for a replacement for my Honda Pilot for a very long time. I have one EV and one gas car. But for me to buy a new EV, it has to have two things. It has to be able to seat seven or eight people and have enough room for my Home Depot trips. And I think the VF9 might just do that. With design by Penn and Farina, a starting price around $50,000 and range well over 300 miles, this is going to be an amazing addition to the North American EV offering. So if you're interested in reserving one of these vehicles, check the link in the description. We'll have quite a few perks. You can save a little bit of money and be one of the first to check out this car. Huge thanks to VinFast and you for supporting the companies that support this show. For the average person living in the U.S., over half of your annual energy bills go toward heating and cooling. Most people favor natural gas, at least in the U.S., because at least on paper, it seems significantly cheaper than electricity. Gas is measured in therms. One therm equals 100 cubic feet of gas or 100,000 BTUs, which is the same as about 30 kilowatt hours of electricity. So hypothetically, if one therm costs 60 cents, electricity would have to cost roughly 2 cents per kilowatt hour to be comparable. But even in Louisiana, which has some of the lowest electricity rates in the country, they still pay roughly 7 cents per kilowatt hour. This again is just a function of how affordable natural gas historically has been. While prices tend to vary by region, generally with all the factors considered, natural gas prices are two to three times lower than electricity. But with all the mitigating factors like dwindling supply and blossoming demand, a global pandemic, and geopolitical turmoil, natural gas prices for the 2021-2022 winter season have exploded, upwards of 50% increases from the year before. But electricity isn't cheap either. This means to replace gas, we'd either need to make cheaper electricity or more efficient technology. And that's where the geothermal heat pump could have a massive advantage. So let's take a look at this in the real world. Let's go someplace with a frosty winter like North Dakota where natural gas currently costs 32 cents per therm. The annual energy cost for an average household using a natural gas furnace with a 95% efficiency rating comes out to roughly $436 a year. An air source heat pump in these colder climates, if it had a 160% efficiency, COP, racks up around 613 annually. A ground source heat pump operating with a 350% COP only cost $233 annually. That's almost half the cost of natural gas. Where do these numbers come from? This graph. On the Montana Dakota Utility website, the company that provides natural gas for the four of the coldest states in the US. Now, you may have noticed one column blurred out. That's on purpose, and we'll get back to that in a second. Just look at the differences in annual cost. According to the EPA, a ground source system can reduce energy consumption by more than 40% compared to an air source heat pump, and over 70% compared to standard heating and cooling. This can mean 30 to 60% off heating costs. But what about here in California, where we're less concerned with frigid winters and more concerned with melting on the sidewalks like we're in the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, geothermal has an edge there too. 20 to 50% of cooling depending on the size of your house and the system you use. So remember, on a really, really hot day, 
Your heat pump is taking the heat from inside your house and it is trying to dispel it outside. But the hotter the outside air is, the less of that gradient there is between the high temperature and the ambient temperature. And as a result, the performance is degraded. But instead, if you could take that hot air in your house and pump it into a ground source geothermal heat pump, well then your efficiency will go up. Because 50 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the time of day, could be between 30 and 50 degrees cooler than the ambient air temperature. This is why geothermal heat pumps are just a win-win because they're better in the winter and in the summer. And depending on where you live, if you have hot summers and really cold winters, well then geothermal is a double win. And if all that wasn't enough, because these systems don't actually burn any fuel and they use grid energy much more efficiently, they're also a much better choice for the environment. Today, heating and cooling account for roughly 10 to 20% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the US, one of the largest contributors to the residential sector behind transportation. A geothermal heating and cooling system can reduce your household emissions by between 75 and 85%. Now, as I mentioned, one column on that chart was conveniently blurred out. Here's where some of the tougher truths about geothermal come into play. One major consideration is the installation cost. Air source heat pumps, depending on if you want to run them in both directions, the heater and a cooler, can cost between $10,000 and $20,000 to install. And ground source heat pumps, yeah, they can range anywhere from $12,000 to $30,000. And that's if you even have the space you would need for a geothermal heat pump. An 11 kilowatt horizontal system would require three ground loops, each about 200 meters in length. Each loop laid in a rectangle with one meter separation between them, resulting in a large rectangle seven meters in width by 100 meters in length, meaning you'd need roughly 700 square meters in total. The larger your system, the more space required. Now there are vertical loop systems that require less space but more equipment for drilling deeper holes. These systems can be more efficient since they run deeper where ground temperatures are even more consistent. And they also don't require as much open space, but can be more costly due to more complex installation. Still, while those upfront cost numbers do look kind of crazy, don't go running for the hills just yet. As always, when we dig into the numbers, there's more to the story. For instance, in the US, both state and federal incentive programs can provide homeowners a tax credit up to 30% off the total installation cost for Energy Star rated appliances. So now, a $20,000 system becomes $14,000. And some states like Maryland even offer grants up to $3,000 toward the installation, bringing the entire system cost down to just $11,000. Then there's the longevity of the system. While gas furnaces might be less expensive up front, they tend to last between 10 and 20 years. Traditional HVAC systems can last up to 25 years, and geothermal systems, a closed loop system, can last up to 50 years, and the ground component can last up to 100 years. So while the cost might be higher up front, it can still save you money in the long run. But where these systems can really shine is in new construction. I live in a house that's about 50 years old, and for me to retrofit a geothermal system is just gonna be expensive. But my friend Matt from Undecided is building a brand new house, and I think geothermal is gonna be a central part of what he's going to do. So the right time to build a geothermal system really is when you're building the house. Because imagine digging the holes and running all the ventilation and ductwork before you build the house and you'd have 100 years of much cheaper cost. But if you have the land and you're kind of curious about the technology, an eight to 10 year return on investment is not terribly bad. One of the main reasons more homes in the US don't have geothermal heat pumps is because the technology just wasn't as mature as it is today when these homes were first built. But things are changing. In fact, entire new communities of new home construction are being built with geothermal. Our very good friend Mallory, who lives in Austin, Texas, actually lives in a planned community where every single house has a geothermal heating and cooling system. Hello from Whisper Valley in Austin, Texas. We're a master plan community where every house has a geothermal heat pump, solar panels, spray foam installation, and are zero energy capable. We're so efficient that for a 2,200 square foot house, our electric bills are generally $100. And that's even when it's over 100 degrees in the summer and sometimes in the teens in the winter. Geothermal rocks. In recent years in California, there has been new building code that requires new construction to have solar panels. That went into effect a couple of years ago. Next, California is going to require new buildings to have the electrical in place for a heat pump water heater. And I think in the future, it'll be batteries 
and geothermal possibly as well. These are all technologies that if we could require up front, yeah, your home price might go up a little bit, but it would be baked into the price and you'd have way cheaper electric bills. And one of the reasons why all this really matters is if we could be more efficient with our energy usage, we'd have less brownouts. Whenever there's really hot temperature, people warn you not to run your air conditioner because there might not be enough electricity for everybody and power goes out. So this is one of those things where it saves you on money. It's actually really good for the grid operators because it lowers your energy cost over time and it's good for the environment. So that's why I'm such a huge fan of geothermal, but it really will depend on where you live. In fact, I would love to know, depending on where you live, if you'd consider getting one, maybe you already have one. I don't know how prevalent they are where you live, but if you've got one, I would love to know more about it. And if you wanna nerd out with some more heat pump and geothermal videos, take a look at this playlist we have over here. I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you guys next week.